After Jesus was raised from the dead on the first Easter morning and before he ascended into heaven to go to prepare a place for us, Jesus spent 40 days walking and talking and eating and fellowshipping with the disciples. Among the final words he spoke to them before he left as he, uh, as found in the Gospel of Mark were, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation, Mark 16:50. This statement was among the last things that Jesus said to his followers, but it was not the last thing that he said to his followers. Today we're going to look at the last words that Jesus spoke while here on earth. They're important words. They're absolutely essential for every believer to hear and to heed because without receiving the promise that Jesus gave his followers in his farewell statement, you cannot successfully live the Christian life. You know what happened after the death of Jesus. His followers scattered and abandoned him. Judas betrayed him, then took his own life. Peter denied having ever known him. And the others, they just ran away except for John. They then locked themselves behind closed doors in an attempt to escape the same fate that befell Jesus. They began considering how they might pick up the pieces of their lives, and they were wondering if they they ever could, one day, make sense of all that had taken place. And then, after having all but given up, the unthinkable happened. Mary Magdalene came to where they were and said, "'I've just seen the Lord. He is alive.'" Peter then ran to the tomb to see for himself. Jesus wasn't there, but his shroud was. Peter, however, wasn't yet quite convinced. Luke says he went away wondering to himself what had happened, Luke twenty four twelve. Later that day, Jesus did appear to his disciples in the flesh. They heard him speak. They saw his scars. They ate fish with him, and they believed beyond all doubt that he was who he claimed to be. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Messiah. And eventually Jesus gave them what he called the Great Commission, which I referenced earlier. In this mission statement, Jesus told the disciples that he was calling them to a task that certainly must have seemed like mission impossible. He was telling a ragtag team of misfits, quitters, and underachievers to go out and to change the world. The world, not just your street, not just your neighborhood, not just your side of town, but the world. Jesus certainly knew how monumental this task was and how ill-equipped the disciples were. He knew that they didn't have it in them to pull it off all on their own. They needed something more. And so after Jesus spoke to them about their new global mission, he had one more thing to say to them. It would be the last words they would hear him speak out loud. You might say that his reasoning behind what he would say to them fell along these lines. I've got a monumental job for you to do, a job that's way bigger than you are. And in order to accomplish what I'm asking you to accomplish, you need more than just a set of rules to live by and more than just the promise of heaven after you die. And in order for you to do what I'm asking you to do, you're going to need a blast of dynamite, so to speak. You need to be infused with enough power that you can move beyond yourself and into the next level of living. And if you think that's impossible, don't worry, I've got it covered, he says. Here's exactly what he said to them. Part of this is captured in the final paragraphs of the Gospel of Luke, and part of it is captured in the first chapter of Acts, which was also written by Luke. So Luke twenty four forty nine says, I'm going to send, you, uh, send to you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And then in Acts 1, verses 4 and 5, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Power, he said. 
clothed with power on high. You will receive power. That word power in the Greek is, is uh, dynam dynamis. And it's where we get the word dynamite from. And that's the kind of power that Jesus promised his followers for them back then and for us today. And so today I want to talk to you about experiencing this power from on high, why we need it, and how we receive it. To begin, I'd like to point out a few things. Uh, the first being that knowledge alone is not enough. It's not enough just to know the facts of the Christian faith. It's not enough to know what the Bible says. It's not enough to be able to recite the Apostles' Creed. These things are good, but they're not enough. It's not enough to know that Jesus Christ is Lord and he is risen from the dead. It's a good thing to know. It's a necessary thing to know. It's certainly where you start, but merely knowing it is not enough. If it were, Jesus could could have said to the disciples, okay, look, you know, you've been with me three years. You've heard my teaching and you've learned it well. You've seen the miracles. You know what I can do. And now you've seen me raised from the dead. Therefore, based on the multitude of evidence that I have presented to you, it should be enough for you, knowing all this, to go out and turn the world upside down. But that's not what Jesus said, because he knew that merely knowing the facts in your head is not enough you to get the job done. You need more than just knowledge to get through life. You need power, dynamis or dynamite. This brings me to the next thing I want to point out. Without God's power, life eventually unravels. Your lack of power and your desperate need for power will eventually become obvious in your life. That's what happened to the disciples. They discovered what they were truly capable of on their own. On their own, they were quitters. On their own, they were cowards. On their own, they were betrayers and abandoners and deniers. They came to the end of themselves until they knew the sin, uh, until they knew the sin they were capable of, and they knew the obedience they were incapable of, and they knew they needed something greater than themselves. It was obvious to them and everyone around them. That's why when Jesus said, you will be clothed with power from on high, not one of them spoke up and said, uh, no thanks, Lord, I'm good. I'll, I'll be fine without it. They knew they needed it. Every follower of Jesus Christ eventually comes to this place, to the end of themselves, where in their desperation and their frustration, they must say, I can't do this on my own. I need power. Some get there quickly, some wait for decades to come to this realization, but everyone who is serious about being a disciple eventually comes to the place where they realize that they, they can't do it on their own. They needed something more uh, than what they have. They needed power from above. Even the Apostle Paul fought this battle. In the book of Romans, he said, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do, Romans 7, 15. I find this law at work, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in, with, within me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am, Romans 7, verses 21 to 24. Paul was experiencing the same powerlessness that the disciples experienced after the crucifixion and the same powerlessness that we ourselves experience from time to time. We were created to live in God, connected to him, in relationship to him, even dependent upon him. When we try to live any other way, when we try to disconnect from him and live life in our own power, we inevitably come to the end of ourselves. I have yet to see a credible exception. It happens to everyone. Without God's power in our lives, life eventually unravels. This brings me to the next thing I want to point out. God's power is available to every believer. Verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
This is what Jesus promised his followers, and it's exactly what happened just a few days later, as we'll hear about in uh, two weeks, because next week Pastor Keith will be preaching here at Kingston West. The disciples received power and then some. After the day of Pentecost, there was an explosion of growth and salvation and baptisms and miracles and compassion and unity and holiness and healing. It was an incredible time, and it was the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus made for his followers. That same promise is yours and mine to receive. We all need it, and the good news is that we can all have it. The guidelines that Jesus gave his followers before his ascension are the same guidelines that we should follow today. And so in the time we have remaining, I want to talk to you uh, about what's involved in receiving power from on high. Three principles to remember, three caveats to keep in mind. First of all, I want you to understand that waiting comes first. That's what Jesus told his followers. Stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high, Luke 24, 48. Verse 4 in our text today, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. In our culture today, nobody likes to or wants to wait. There's no time to wait. I, I need it now. I want it now. Uh, why can't I have it now? Why can't I do it now? Why should I have to wait one more minute? Why? Well, get ready because I'm about to say something very profound. We have to wait because we have to wait. It's God's way. But I want you to understand that waiting on God is not the same as waiting on your spouse, for example. When you're waiting on your spouse, it's typically because you're ready and you're waiting for him or her to get ready and all they're doing is holding you up. That's not the way it is with God. When you're waiting on God, most often it's not because he isn't ready, it's because you aren't ready. Therefore, the time we spend waiting on God is time that we need to spend getting ready. So, we need to wait on God. With one caveat in mind, waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. It means using your time to get ready for what God has in store for you. While the disciples were waiting for the gift that the Father had promised, they didn't spend their time doing nothing. Instead, they took care of some business. They chose a new apostle to take Judas's place, and they spent their time in prayer and worship and fellowship with one another. They spent time seeking God. That's the only way to wait. In fact, you should consider these two ideas synonymous, waiting on God and seeking God. They go hand in hand. And I want you to know that waiting on God always pays off. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 27, 14. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not be faint. Waiting pays off when you're waiting and seeking the Lord at the same time. And if you find yourself in a situation right now where you've come to the end of yourself and you know that you need a blast of spiritual dynamite in order to move to the next level, here's what you need to do. Wait on God and seek him while you wait. While you wait, spend your time doing what you can to get ready. If you've got some unfinished business to wrap up, wrap it up. If there are some steps you can take to get ready, Further ready, take those steps. Do everything you can to make yourself ready and put yourself in a position to receive power from on high. And during this time, seek God. Did I mention that? Seek God while you wait. God's power is on the way. It'll arrive when you're ready. Here's the second thing I want you to understand. When God's power arrives, you'll know. How will you know? Sometimes you'll see it in the circumstances around you. God will uh, begin to cause things to happen and you will uh, know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he has arrived and he is calling you to move forward. 
Sometimes you'll sense it in your spirit. I've said more times than I can count that we don't live by our feelings, and that will always be true. But at the same time, there are times when God's Spirit moves in your life, and you know it's happening because you feel it. Waves of joy and love and peace and confidence and certainty and compassion and purpose. I recently heard the story of Michael Morton, who was wrongfully convicted in Texas of murdering his wife by a corrupt police force and a dishonest district attorney. For two decades, he languished in prison, losing appeal after appeal. Even though the evidence existed that would overturn his conviction, the DA kept blocking it and the courts refused to consider it. And then one day after he had another legal disappointment, he came to the end of the road and he cried out in desperation, God, please help me. I've got nothing left. Nothing happened that day, but one night, a few weeks later, as he was getting ready to go to sleep, he put on his headphones so that the music would drown out the prison sounds around him. And suddenly he was clothed with power from on high. In his words, God God bathed him in light. And from that day on, he was a changed man. He was a free man, even though he remained incarcerated for six more years. Finally, even though the district attorney did everything he could to prevent uh, uh, the withheld evidence from being properly tested, it was tested and Michael Morton was exonerated and released from prison. Today, he'll tell you that I was released from prison in uh, June 2011, but I was set free six years earlier when I had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, and I was clothed with power from on high. See, when God's power arrives, you'll know it. You'll see it in the circumstances around you. You'll sense it in your spirit, and you'll also see a difference in the aftermath. The results you begin to experience won't be what they used to be. I can speak from experience. When I have tried to do things, even ministry-related things in my own power, the results have been abysmal. When I'm moving in ministry and life by the power of the Holy Spirit, the results are eternal. God's power makes that much of a difference. So to borrow a line from uh, the good people at American Express, I would say, don't leave home without it. Seek God's power and his anointing in everything you do. Now, here's a caveat. Receiving God's power doesn't mean that he does everything and you do nothing. If we win 100 people to Christ this year, it's not going to be because God randomly sends people here while we sit back and wait for him to fill the room. We still have to put forth the effort. We're still doing the work, but the difference is that he's now powering the engine. Sometimes the work is challenging. It's exhausting. It involves late nights, long hours, and all the determination you can muster. But the difference is that you're doing it with his anointing and his blessing is on your efforts. It's the same in your personal life. Experiencing God's power doesn't mean that you sit around and wait for him to do it all. It means that you do what you can do and let him work through you. Here's the third thing I want you to understand. God's power is always related to God's purpose for your life. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God wants to use you in such a way that others will see his glory in you. He wants to use you in such a way that your life is a testimony to his greatness and his goodness and his mercy and his compassion and his overwhelming love. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And God's purpose for you is that you become a productive citizen, that in your work and your relationships and your activities, you are furthering the kingdom of God. And that means that in your work and your relationships and your activities, you are touching lives and ministering to others in the name of Jesus. Here's a caveat to keep in mind. God's power is not just for you, it's for the benefit of others. You will be clothed with power from on high so that your life will have meaning and purpose, and that purpose is to be a blessing for others. Here's what it comes down to. 
God's plan for you as an individual and for all of us together as a church is really too big for us to imagine. It's like mission impossible. Some of you may be thinking, me? Change the world? I mean, I can barely get through the day. And how can we as a church expand our ministry when it feels like some days it's hard to manage what we're already doing? How is it possible? Well, it's only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you need more of God's power in your life, then decide today that you will seek him and wait expectantly and prepare yourself in every way possible so that you are in a position for him to move in your life. And move he will. He'll change the circumstances around you. He'll change the circumstances within you. And he'll pour out his blessing upon all your efforts. God's power makes all the difference in the way we live our lives. When we try to live in our own power, we're like an engine running uh, on oil, low on oil, knocking around everywhere we go. But when we are filled with God's power from on high, our lives run like a well-oiled machine. Not problem-free, not pain-free, but filled with power nonetheless. In the course of this series, I have said again and again that you cannot make your mark on the world until God has made his mark on you. This is how he does it, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's a make your mark principle for this week. Ask God to fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can be a difference maker in the lives of others. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we come before you. We come before you acknowledging that and, and asking for your forgiveness for trying to, to live this Christian life on our own power, in our own strength. We know, Lord, that we need the power of your Holy Spirit to be at work within us. And we know that in order to do that, there may be things in our lives that we need to deal with with your help, that we need to surrender, that we need to give over to you, that we need to repent of in order for the power of your Holy Spirit to be at work through us. And so, Lord, help us to be attentive to listening to what you would say to us. And, Lord, continue that great work that you've begun in each of us. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.